While we have learned the history of the Banu Hakim, those called by older kindred Asamites, we have yet to delve deeper into their clan's structure and traditions. Unlike many of the Camarilla and Sabat aligned clans, the Banu Hakim have maintained a complex and multi layered internal culture, easily rivaling that of some of the most organized clans of the aforementioned sects. It is theorized that the clan's caste like internal structure and bloodline like variations came to be because of the children's relative isolation for longer stretches of time. There may be some merit to this theory, as other clans have likewise developed offshoot strains during long periods of isolation, the gangrel being especially prolific in branching off into new variations. Likewise, the clan had few allies who could aid them in certain tasks, unlike the European clans who often lived close together and thus niched themselves somewhat to whatever their clan would be best at doing, and thus they needed to see to their needs themselves. The viziers, the bloodline of artisans and scholars, are said to have come to be in order to tend to the mortals in their vicinity, maintaining peaceful relationships and guiding them, as well as of course producing great works of art and science and knowledge quite on par with many of the other creatively inclined clans. The warriors, in turn, would protect both their herds and their lands from outside threats, having long since abandoned their role as judges of the other clans, at least until it was suitable to resume doing so. And the sorcerers worked studiously to strengthen the clan's grasp over blood magic and, after the curse put on them by the Bali, and later the Tremere, trying to find a way to break free from them. Naturally, this kind of comparison elicits less than excited replies from many of the other clans who decry the idea that they would so easily fit into a niche in the vampiric society. Yet it is an idea met with some support as well, especially from the Ravnos and Gangrel, who share similarities after all. The Banu Hakim themselves have no words on this theory one way or another, and have therefore chosen neither to confirm nor deny it. Yet this is also tinted somewhat by what the world knows of the clan, and how secluded they have remained for so long. The rise of Urshulgi has led to roughly a third of the clan, primarily viziers and sorcerers, leaving the Alamut to join the Camarilla, and thus more is learned of their history for each night that passes. The Banu Hakim are known and feared for their cohesion. Recent events notwithstanding, there have always been very few children created who have had no relationship to the masters of Alamut. Blood sorcery was used to send instructions and information long before the discovery of radio transmissions and telephones, a method that has now since come back in vogue with the risk that modern surveillance bureaus bring to the masquerade. Likewise, the Banu Hakim have held on to their history and traditions firmly, and in many of the children a certainty of purpose and right has been planted since a young age. The clan was chosen, no, tasked by the other clans to pass judgment on their childer, and this agreement has never since been broken. Not even Cain himself has stepped in to absolve the children of Hakim of their purpose. Thus, there is a sense of pride and responsibility in many of the children. They are uh, cut above the rest, suited to pass judgment on their lessers. This, combined with their general distrust for the European kindred, stemming back to the Crusades and even further, has created a unity within the clan that has only now been weakened. Yet obviously there were some inner turmoil and resentment as the warrior caste took control over the clan following Hakim's departure. The warrior caste were also most commonly those who would hold the position of eldest, or the old man of the mountain. Interestingly, this position has been held twice by women of the clan, yet the phrasing never did change with them. The last one being Jamal, who served as the eldest from the end of the Convention of Thorns in 1494 up until the awakening of Urshulgi in 1998, after which he was executed for his refusal to abandon his faith in Allah. Urshulgi furious that religion had taken the place of Hakim's laws and the path of blood in the hearts of many of the clan. Orshulgi has however not claimed the Black Throne himself, saying instead that it is a place reserved for Hakim, but as Jamal was a fellow child of Hakim, and died quite easily at Orshulgi's hands, no one is inclined to challenge his authority, regardless of him being the eldest or not. Beneath the eldest are the Duat, the Council of Three, representatives of each of the three castes of the Ban Hakim. The Duat is no more, however, after the schism and Urshulgi's destruction of the last caliph, 
the representative of the warriors. The caliph's purpose was to aid the elders in all things martial. Whether it was defense or offense, the caliph would speak for the warriors of the clan, although only foolish and short-lived caliphs assumed that this meant that theirs was an authority over the rest of the warriors. A good caliph, thus, was someone who guided, not ordered, the other warriors around. Al-Ashrad, the former Amr, that is the sorcerer's representatives and child of Urshulgi, is now the leader of the Camarilla-aligned Banu Hakim, and has no desire to recreate the clan's circle of leadership, as this would no doubt cause undue suspicion and accusations from the clan's enemies in the tower. Al-Ashrad has held the position of Amr for close to two millennia and is synonymous with the title. Although the Amr is supposed to be the greatest blood sorcerer of the clan, clearly Al-Ashrad is not, as it took Urshulgi no measure of effort to break the Tremir curse on their clan, a curse Al-Ashrad had spent the last 500 years trying to counteract. Even so, there has been no election of a new Amr since the schism, and here likewise Urshulgi seems to have no interest in replacing this member of the Duat. Finally, the vizier, that is to say, the representative of the vizier caste, is Tigurius, who has held the seat for the last three terms. Each term for a vizier is 63 years, as well as once in the 14th century. Although Tigurius voiced his dissatisfaction with Urshulgi's ascent and subsequent execution of the former eldest and caliph, the risen Methuselah made no efforts to silence or correct him. Thus, when Tigurius fled the Alamut along with Al-Akhrad, he too joined the Camarilla, and rumors abound that he is hoping for a seat as the first Jessicar. He is also said to have entered into a blood wedding recently with Victoria Ash, in order to strengthen an alliance between the Camarilla and the Middle Eastern Ashira sect of Kinred. Beneath the Duat are the Silsila, also known as the Shakari, or Keepers of the Blood. They are both the assistants to the Duat, but also intended to be the embodiment of Hakim's laws and the Path of Blood. They are fanatically loyal to their clan and purpose, and likewise maintain both the defenses of the Alamut as well as the wealth of knowledge stored within it. When the schism was a fact, a significant number of the Silsila declared themselves loyal to Al-Akhrad and were thus subsequently slaughtered by the remaining Shakari, who instead chose to side with Urshulgi. Their composition is intended to match that of the clans, and thus the majority of the keepers of the blood are of the warrior caste. While the seat of those who sided with Al-Akhrad have since been filled with those more aligned with Urshulgi's hardline stance, they now take their orders directly from the Methuselah if he decides to give them any to begin with. Within the warrior caste there are several ranks to indicate the experience and value of the members. These are informal, Hakim never declared this to be a thing, but it is of value to any of the children who are planning an operation and need to be able to gauge the skill of those under their command. All warriors begin as Fidai which means that they are still undergoing their education. They are not lacking in spirit, but in skill, and can be closest compared to a fledgling or shovelhead in term of status. Calling an established warrior Fidai, thus, is like calling a kindred fledgling. Above the Fidai are the Rafiq, a warrior who has proven that they can take care of themselves. Rafiqs are above Fidai because they are trusted to no longer need guidance, and therefore it is a term used amongst warriors to refer to each other as its meaning can be translated roughly to comrade. The Da'i are a subset of the Rafiq, and is a title given to warriors versed enough in a faith to be on par of an ordained priest or similar. This is also a title granted to those warriors who are sufficiently far down the path of blood to help guide others. Another subset of the Rafiq are the Ace, which is a title looked at with some disapproval by the clan's elders. Essentially, it is a Banu Hakim who has slain more than five kindred of other clans and is a term adopted from Westerners therefore also more common amongst European and American Banu Hakim. Many aces keep track of their marks with specialized tattoos, souvenirs, or other symbols to indicate their so-called kill count. The Council of Scrolls is an organization maintained by both the viziers as well as the sorcerers. It exists to both present some manner of authority over the clan's scholars, gauging their skills, but also to establish a body of standardized and accepted knowledge within the clan. Things like the standard language of rituals of blood magic, for example, is up to the council to decide. The council also evaluates and appoints titles to these two castes' members. These are of course formalities, and more often than not signs of approval and appreciation of skill, and some Banu Hakim have no care what the council thinks of them. These ranks are Aspirants, Associates, Master, Distinguished Masters, Full Masters, and Emeritus. 
Most of these are fairly self-explanatory, Emeritus for example merely being a master who has withdrawn from actively participating in clan affairs, albeit still one whose knowledge is respected and revered by the others. Incidentally, this term is also, if not most often, used for those viziers and sorcerers who may have entered torpor, and lately it has also been used colloquially to refer to a member of these castes who have chosen neither side of the schism, a group who are also referred to as the dispossessed. There are various factions within the Banu Hakim who have less formal connotations, although that does not mean that they have had no influence over their clan, overt or not. The Sisterhood of the Erinias is a loose affiliation of female children, formed in a time when women were scorned by the male-dominated parts of the clan. The Sisterhood is a social circle, who mostly just offer understanding, advice and support to each other, although they have been known to act against particularly nasty opponents to their role in the clan. The Web of Knives, however, is a much more hands-on group dedicated to producing the fiercest possible warriors, recruiting from lethal mortal assassins and training them even further. They are murderers without peers, single-mindedly pursuing their targets and goals above all else, and this is reflected in their relatively low number, often even below 20, as few recruits can match the expectations put on them. There are other factions as well, but these two remain perhaps the best known. Finally, a little known fact about the Baru Hakim is that they grow darker with age. Within a few years of their embrace, they will have often regained the color of their mortal days, and over time they will eventually turn pitch black, like onyx, and this process can be sped up through diablery. Incidentally, Al-Akhrad's skin, despite his age, remains as pale white as on the night of his embrace, a fact that has not evaded many. Some claim that Urshulgi, his sire, himself is not one of the Banu Hakim, his flesh burnt beyond recognition before his embrace, and thus the color of his skin indiscernible. Yet these kind of theories would certainly lead to the unfortunate deaths of those who would speak of them. Perhaps the Black Shepherd's mysterious appearance and skills were not simply a product of providential natural talent, but something far more sinister. Their numbers are five, and they are dark gods. Snow, an insightful yet compassionate master, Bambi Parsons, whose passion inspires and leads by example, Dr. Sheepington, a sage and venerable keeper of ancient wisdom, the unemployed writer whose words have guided nations through the aeons, and Dugal, the ancient and terrifying who stalks the night. These are our masters, and to worship them is to attain salvation. Their childer, the Methuselah, sit like kings and queens above us, their wills ours to obey. They are her satanic majesty Danny, reborn through fire and ice, Maximilian S. Hardcastle, a master of our ancient jihad, Socrates Johnson, a scholar and a mentor, the ambitious and loyal Lauren Eason, as well as the enigmatic yet influential Procyon. On the Council of the Primogen are seated Edward Reed, Colin Gifford, 06, Stonewolf 18, Jokerman, Ian Nichols, The Black Friar, Ravenfang, Brad Hardwick, and Pilgrim, wise leaders and of good judgment. This week the council would wish to honor the Elder Gaslight 88 and the Ancile Evelyn. We thank you for your loyalty. All our elders, Ancile and neonates, receive our gratitude from the bottoms of our hearts. Without your support, this would not be possible. And thank you for watching. Now be careful out there, for Gehenna may soon be upon us.